All right, so I guess we'll start proper. Uh, so welcome, guys. Today we'll be having an introduction to Git and GitHub. And this is uh, part of a larger series of workshops called Hacker School. Uh, I'm Reynold, a core team member of NUS Hackers. So as I mentioned previously, this is like one of many workshops. Um, <coughs> the next workshop they will have is uh, HTML and CSS. That's going to happen uh, next Saturday. So do look out for that. And of course, you can always follow our website for the latest updates. Perfect. And uh, of course, the link to the slides are available here. All right, so this is uh, the rough overview of today's uh, sort of introduction to Git and GitHub. Uh, so that like a good presentation contains a lot of GIFs and memes, so like, expect a fair amount of those. Um, so we'll just start off with um, installing Git and creating a GitHub account, after which we have a very sort of like um, crash course on what Git is, followed by some basic uh, sort of bash commands. So that's like sort of like how you interact with your shell. And then we'll go in down and proper with actually using Git, followed by using GitHub, followed by some advanced workflows. So this is when like we combine Git and GitHub together. And finally, we sort of like go into some like quality of life hacks that could hopefully improve your Git workflow. Sorry? Oh, yeah, and um, at any point in time, if you sort of like running into any problems or questions to ask, like do raise your hand and like my friends would uh, help you. And we also have like regular breaks along the way. So like we'll use those sort of like time slots to just make sure everyone's up to speed. Perfect. Yep, so if you haven't done so already, like definitely install Git. So you can definitely find the links online and um, do create a Git account as well. Yep. So has anyone like not created a GitHub account yet? All right, uh, yeah, just do create one soon. All right, awesome. And um, so what we to tell you if you have installed Git is to sort of like run command Git in your terminal. Um, anyone using Windows? Yeah, so if you're using Windows, you can probably click on the Git terminal app. So if you're not sure, that's Razor and it will help you. And once um, Git is actually installed, what you'll find is if you run this command, oops. Yeah, like this, uh, you, this is all like the output that you expect. The version number might differ, but um, this just tells us that hey, Git is installed. Yep. So when you first install Git, you need to tell Git like who you are, what your email is, so that you can sort of like tag the changes that you make. So definitely like run these commands in, uh, passing your name, your address, and so on and so forth. This is just a one-time setup sort of thing. And to check that everything is set up as it should, use the final command git config list, and it'll show you like everything is specified. So yep. So like this is how my config look like. It has my name, it has my um, email, and like um, how credentials are set up. All right. Yeah, and of course, uh, you're going to need a text editor to edit your files. Uh, no strong preference for any particular editor, per se, but uh, I would highly suggest either Sublime Text or Visual Code Studio. So like, both are free, so why not? All right, so now let's go in proper. So like, what's Git? So I'm not sure if you guys encountered this scenario before. You're writing a document for some report. Um, you're happy with the current state, and halfway through, you say, hey, I want to make some changes. But at the same time, you don't want to lose your previous state of document. So what happens in the end, you start preparing all these like, numbers at the back. And as you make more and more changes, it gets like a huge uh, mess. So for documents, it's probably fine, in the sense that like, not much would really like, move. But imagine like, uh, if you're working on actual code base, um, a lot of things are moving around, and like, this sort of um, style of appending numbers at the end wouldn't be scale, right? So this is where version control comes to rescue. So you can think of version control as a software that allows you to track how your project changes over time. And you can think of it as sort of like a time traveler in like Back to the Future. And um, apart from Git being the most popular um, version control software, there are other alternatives like Mercurial and Subversion. But um, chances are in 99% of companies you work in, or whatever projects you may find, they probably use Git. So we're going to cover a huge base by just using Git. Yep. So the first part will be looking into sort of like very basic bash commands. This is not really relevant to Git per se, but um, it's just useful to know. Right. So if you're using a, a Mac or a Linux, you probably want to fire up your terminal. If you're using Windows, you would probably want to fire up the um, Git CLI tool. So those using Windows, uh, like if you have any troubles firing up that CLI tool, do raise your hand. I'm just gonna pause a minute. Yep. Which one? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I think that's it for now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Uh, we'll we we'll show more in a while. Oh, uh, you have the previous one? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So is anyone like, like does anyone not have like the terminal up and running? Oh, but you can see it this. Okay. Can you fire up the terminal? Um, this one. Yeah, perfect. All right, cool. So like the first uh, command we look into is the cd command, which is shorthand for changing of directory. So it just, as it, it's pretty much what it says on the tin, it just changes to the directory name as if provided. So we can sort of see that in action in this particular GIF. Let's let it reset. Yeah? Pardon? Oh, it's too small, is it? OK. Uh, I might just give a live example. Uh, all right, cool. So I'm creating my home directory, and if I were to do a CD desktop, it'll move to desktop. So you can sort of see like the state of the desktop in my window manager here, and you can see that there's another folder called my project. And if I wish to move into that particular folder, I'll just do CD my project. And uh, most terminals come with sort of a tab autocomplete. So in this case, notice that the whole name is called my project. I can just type up to MYP and it autocomplete it for me. <laughs> so like, do feel you to play around and ensure that you sort of like have a rough understanding of how the CD command works. Yep, so the first part is like CD followed by the file name. That allows you to, sorry, the folder name. That allows you to jump to the folder. If I wish to jump out, I'll just do cd uh, then two dots. So two dots is like sort of like the go stun command. It allows you to go up the current folder. Yeah, like if you're lost, let's uh, open up the slides and uh, take the GIF, then hopefully that sort of like concretizes what we were talking about just now. Okay, so now that we have the cd command out of the way, we'll move on to ls, which basically lists your directory contents. So in this particular folder, I have uh, two folders. That's so I have one folder called folder and two files. So notice when I press the ls command, the output sort of reflects um, what is sort of listed in my uh, file explorer. Okay, is anyone hopelessly lost at this point? Uh, right. Yes. Um, I thought I installed it, but then it went to this page. I mean, I installed it. Uh, Uh, just to ensure it's on the same page, is anyone not able to run the ls command on your terminal? Let's just run it down there on the whiteboard. Okay, 
Okay, cool. So quick recap, CD allows you to move between directories, iOS allows you to look into the directory, and we'll move on to actually creating directories. So that's uh, with the mkdir command, you can see there's a shorthand for make directory, and it basically creates a directory of the specified name. So you look at the GIF, I'm just calling um, make directory folder 2, and once that command is run, we see that folder 2 is indeed created. Pretty straightforward. So now that we know how to create directories, the next one is how do we create files? Oops, sorry, yep. So before creating files, uh, this other command, which is called cat, uh, it basically displays the contents of a file. So in this particular GIF, I have a file1.txt, which contains the following text. And notice that the same text is uh, spit out when I run the cat command. Then uh, we have this. Okay, one is this. Yep, the next one is the rm command that removes a, a file. So do know that that's permanent and can't be undone. So in this particular GIF, I remove uh, file tree, and we notice that it's gone. And uh, let's do know that's like undoable. So like, yeah, look out. And I guess one thing that I sort of missed out was the creating of a file. That one is with the touch command. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I guess one command I left out was the touch. Yeah, and that pretty much creates the file. Control C. Oh, yeah, so like one quick tip, uh, when you're halfway through typing a command and you want to bail, you should press the uh, Control C command. That allows you to sort of like exit whatever you're currently running. Like one notification, I can just do this. And let's say I give up halfway, I can just press Control C. And like it just resets it. Let's add that in. So let's quickly run through the last two and then I'll just uh, give a very quick summary slide. So the next one is called the CP command, which is basically um, the copy command. Sorry? Oh, what's it happening? So let's go through two more commands, and then we just have a very quick summary of all the commands that we went through just now. So we have two more, which is the copy and the move. So this is like pretty much the same as Control C, Control V. So scenario. <coughs> so CP copies the file, and then MV moves the file. Right, and this is sort of like the TLDR of whatever we covered just now.
So like the main reason for using all these like bash commands is that like um, you interact with Git through the terminal. So like being able to do everything within the terminal is just gonna make things a lot more simpler. And like sort of notice like the analog between the commands here and like the stuff that you do in your file manager. All right, so at this point in time, anyone is still stuck or needs help? <coughs> so at this point in time, is it uh, safe to see that everyone's like comfortable with um, interacting with your terminal? Yeah, if that's the case, we can move on to the actual Git stuff. Sorry. Too fast. Oh, yeah, sure. Right. Alright, so if everyone's comfortable with using the terminal, we'll move on to the actual Git stuff. So now we're sort of uh, running, we sort of like sort of um, go into how we actually use Git. And um, a note here is that all the important Git technologies in Magenta so are terms that you commonly see if you sort of like look on Stack Overflow for Git and whatnot. So the first one, uh, the first key, so uh, the first key concept they're running through is uh, called repositories. It's often shortened as repo, and <coughs> You can think of it as a collection of all the files and the history of these files. So a pretty nice mental model is to sort of map each repo to a project. So the next time I'm going to create a new project that would correspond to a new repo. And it can live on a local machine like your current laptop, and it can also live on a remote server like GitHub. So we'll see how the remote server bit works in a short while. So the first one is to actually create your Git repository. So with that, um, we first create a folder. We we'll go into the folder and then we we'll run the git init command. So I can just demo that here. Right. Uh, can people in the last row see this? All good. All right. Cool. So I'm creating my desktop file uh, folder. I just create a new folder. I'll go into the folder, and I call it git init. So assuming all is well, you would uh, expect this output. So once again, if you're stuck, just raise your hand, it will help you. All right, so now that the git repository is created, time to create some files. So now let's just create a new file. Um, you just run the touch followed by your name dot txt. Yep, so once your file is created, if you open, up, if you open it up in the um, file manager, hopefully you can see the same file that was created as well. And we'll move on to the next step, which is uh, checking the current status of our repo. So now that we've added a new file, git is aware of that change, and if you were to sort of call the git status command, it would 
tell us that it has found this particular file and it's under the list called untracked files. Right, so we see a bunch of like random terms fly out. We see things like branch, commits, untracked. All of this seems very foreign for now, but we'll run through them in turn. All right, so now this is a good segue into sort of like how Git works under a nutshell. And for that, we'll introduce uh, two main terms first. So the first one is what we call a commit, which is a record of files that you have changed. And then um, the next one is the staging area, which sort of tracks um, changes that you want to commit. So I guess a very good mental model for this is to think of uh, Git as um, various boxes of commitments. So your current state of the world is described um, in a cardboard box. So that's like the lowest level commitment. Right? So once you make changes, you're happy with the changes, you move on to the next level, which is to stage. So staging, or the index, can be thought as, as your wooden box. So these are things that, hey, I intend to commit these changes. And when you're really, really happy with these changes, the highest level commitment is to move them into a steel box. So once in the steel box, it's locked in history, and um, for all purposes, it cannot be changed. So to run through that flow again, um, you first start in a, a cardboard box, lowest level. When you <coughs> sort of stage the file, you move it to the wooden box. And then when you finally want to commit that to history, you move that into the steel box. So notice there are like sort of two transitions here, from the cardboard box to the wooden box. That one is done with what we call the git add command. So next time I say add it to the wooden box, I mean git add. And then when I say move the box, sorry, move things from the wooden box to the steel box, that's why I call it the uh, commit command. Like, does that make sense? So we'll look at two commands here, git add and git commit. So git add is from cardboard to wood, and commit is from wooden to steel. So let's see how we use those two commands in action. So previously we already created the file, like which is your name.txt, right? So now let's move that file into our wooden box. So with that, we use the git add command. So the usual syntax is git add followed by the file name. As your projects get bigger and you have like more files in your repo, it's probably super tedious to run like multiple git commands for every single file. So a shortcut for that is to use git uh, then dot. So they'll add everything in the repo. So let's do that. Right, so assuming everything is done correctly, once you run git add and then call git status again, what was previously red is now green. So this tells us that uh, my file is now in the wooden box. <coughs> is everyone able to reach this particular screen? We have like one green line and like no red lines. Oh yes, um, so like all the changes you're making right should be in the same folder in which you ran the git init command. Sorry if that was unclear. Yeah, so basically if you run git status and like, nothing appears, chances are you're editing the file in the wrong directory. So is anyone not at this uh, state yet? Oh, it looks like everyone's good. So now let's actually move things into our steel safe box, which is to commit. So this is uh, where we run the git command, sorry, the git commit command, and the syntax is git commit dash m, followed by some message describing the commit they have changed. So it's usually good practice to have the commit message to be as descriptive as possible, because end of the day, you're gonna run through the logs and like, you'll see whatever you wrote. So if it's like undescriptive, like blah, blue, blee, like that's not gonna be helpful when you look at it like five months down the, round, uh, down the road. So let's actually do that.
So assuming everything went well, you, s you sort of see this command, and like it gives like a bunch of summary statistics. Like in this case, one file changed, uh, zero, zero insertions, zero deletions, makes sense, it's an empty file, and then a bunch of random stuff. So anyone not at this state yet? Cool, so like if you made this far, congrats, you have done your first commit. And as a quick recap, this sort of describes the um, life cycle of a particular file. Hopefully you can see the analogy between the boxes I brought up just now. Uh, when you first create a file, it's called untracked. So that's when it's our sort of like cardboard box. And when you make modifications, you then stage the file. So staging is the process of putting it into the wooden box. And then the last step is to commit it, which is moving it to the steel safe box. So once you've sort of done a commit, everything is um, back in sort of the state it previously was. All right, so once you make a bunch of commits, it's sort of nice to know like what you have done so far. And the commit, sorry, the command for that is the git log. So 99% of the time, you're just gonna run the git log command and that will sort of give you like this long wall of text or like things that you've changed. Um, so let's sort of demo that. Yep, so in this case, it only shows one particular commit, which makes sense when you have one. Um, and I guess like for you to sort of leave the state, you should press the Q button. You can press Q or you can press Control C to leave this particular like buffer, so to speak. Yep, so you can imagine as, as you make more commits, uh, this particular window will show a lot more text, but that'll be for later. Right, awesome. Um, so other possible um, options to git logging are as follows. This one itself shows um, a one line uh, log for every commit. So that's pretty nifty if you have like a bunch of commits and you wanna s just uh, have a high level look at what's happening. So let's demo that. Yeah, in this case, that's one line. And we do have all that crazy information that we saw just now. Yep, and a bunch more that you can sort of check out your own free time. So like 99% of the time, just use git log and you can see what's happening. All right, so next bit. So now we've sort of seen like um, the sort of uh, staging and the commit cycle. Now let's sort of take another step back and see what a typical git project sort of looks like. So it's basically broken down into three portions. So the, the bulk is really sort of like the metal safe, which is like where we store all the safe changes in. And how that sort of looks like is a sort of like chain of commits. Because each commit is um, sort of like linked to the commit that came before it. So we can see sort of like this uh, timeline-ish uh, structure, where the most uh, latest commit is on the right, and the newer ones, uh, sorry, the older ones on the left. Yep. Then you see these like orange boxes on top. These are what we call branches. Branches are sort of like pointers to certain points, sorry, pointers to certain like um, parts of this long branch. And you can think of it as sort of like um, having different windows into different parts of uh, the timeline, if you will. And another key point to note here is that each commit is uniquely identified by what we call a hash. So what happens under the hood is that when you do a git commit, git does some crazy calculations, spits out a unique number, and that number uniquely identifies your commit. So if I were to refer to this particular commit, I would refer, it, I would refer to it by its hash, which is like D9, uh, D8985. Yep. And um, two other items here are the stage or the index, so that's the wooden box I described just now, and the working directory, which is your cupboard box, which I also mentioned just now. So 
Well, anyone have any questions on this bit? Like any part that doesn't make any sense? So maybe just one quick question. Um, how many safes do you think we have in, a, in one repo? One, two, three, infinite. What do you guys think? So intuitively, um, it will make sense that there should only be one safe per repo, right? Because suppose you have two safes, so which represents the exact state of the repo, right? So you think it's as safe as being like your source of truth, so there's only one safe. All right, cool. Yep, so now we're going to bombard you with even more crazy terms. So the first one is hit. Um, that's sort of like a reference to the last commit, and that is pretty much uh, where you are right now. So TRDR hit is where you are right now. Uh, master is traditionally the main branch of your project. So as you start working on like bigger projects, master always sort of reflects the current state of the project. Uh, branch is a pointer to some commit. So you can imagine like sometimes you don't want to look at master, you look at someone else, somewhere else, then that's where branching comes in. Or suppose you want to create work that would be independent of what's happening on master, that's where branches will also come in. Then next bit is um, the cache, that's our wooden box. And finally, the, wooden direc the working directory, which is the state of the world that we're looking at. That's also like the cardboard box that I described previously. All right, so let's have a quick exercise to ensure that like, everyone's on the same page. So first one, uh, add some lines to the text that you, cre uh, you previously created and commit that change. So that's the first one. Second one is now let's create a whole new file, add some text, and commit that change. So once you've done the first two points, you now have three commits. First one being the one we created just now, the second one being item one, and the last one being item two. And then for the last exercise, um, observe that when we do a git add, we're moving things from our cardboard box to the wooden box. Now the question now is, how do I move it back from the wooden box to the cardboard box? Right, so basically I'm asking, how do you do a reverse git add? And the hint to that is to sort of study the output of a git status if, when there's something in your wooden box. So maybe give you guys like 10 minutes to run this through. And like, if you're still lost, just like raise your hand, we'll come to you. So look at item one, right? So yeah. yeah, so let's say this is the file you created, right? Maybe you open this up. Open this up. Okay. Yeah, then like just type random things inside. Maybe Okay. Okay, cool. So it's saved already, you right? So now go to your terminal. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, where is the cipher? It's on desktop. So first do desktop, CD desktop. So Okay, so you're in tab. oops, my bad. Uh, maybe press Q. What's this? Oh, press Q. Q is a quip. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, quip, yeah. Okay, okay nice. Um, so now that the file is created, uh, what should we do next? So we have, yeah, so commit the change, right? Commit the bar. I have to, like, give status first, right? Yeah, give status. To see, to see the status on the page. Yeah. Also, once I modified it, it's not in the steel box. I have to add it. Okay, so it's not in the wooden box. It's still in your copper box. Uh, cup, I mean, but I have, I have already uh, added to the what, steel box before. Yeah, so, so once once you I change the, the content, I have to add it again to yeah. the first digits again. So, uh, key, um, but how can I know my changes to the... 
Who is test? Uh, the deed add. Oh, so you're going to see why you changed this, right? Yeah, oh, so this is a bit ahead, but you just want to get div. Yeah, so it says that you added this line, I'm David. Oh, I'm David. So this one, I did add. Okay, so you run git status. Yep, so you see the mouse in your wooden box, wooden and box. now we move it to the steel box. Only we get it to the steel box, we we'll get to the final stage. <coughs> yeah. So did commit and can you tap the name? Or Up okay. to you. So okay. maybe it's add more lines, for example. So if you look at your git log, you'll see two commits. Git log? Yeah. Actually rename it. Yeah, so you see this is the first one, then uh, this is the one you just made. Oh, the first. Oh, okay, okay. So it's like comments, right? Yeah. Like comments, so what I have done. Yeah. So, okay. So this means I modify this text twice. Yeah. The first one, I did this, then I do this. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. I just want to ask, how can you like mix my window to be like this? Because this. Uh, oh, okay. uh, it'll be a bit later, but e can, can I just Google with you after it? Or yeah, sure. Uh, oh, it'll okay. be mentioned the later part. Okay. Yeah, all the, the, the fancy uh, things. Yeah. The fancy things are very cool, so, but you know, it's <laughs> very plain. So. Yeah, no worries. Uh, but sorry, can I? I don't know. Uh, I mean, every time I want to uh, create a new file and, and I mean, I did it, I have to. Can I use my uh, use a command line? Yeah, so uh, touch. So, so touch and then the file name. So it's already in the I yeah, the file name. Thing. Yeah. Uh, do I need to? No, they. Uh, okay. New. New file. Yeah. Okay. New file created. So I. Knows how to like to open it and write something. Uh, do you have Sublime? Sorry. Do you use Sublime text? Text. Oh, we don't have it. Okay, then uh, let's run code. So you have VS Code, right? Yeah, so VS code. VS code. And then the name of the file, new line. Yeah. Oh, v code. Oh, V code. Or can I use Vim? I don't know. Oh, Vim also can. Are you familiar with Vim? I don't know. Da 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 da. Yeah. Nice. Shift. Hey. Oh, escape, escape. Escape. Sorry. Now press the escape. Yeah. Then WQ. Oh, okay. So, so I think you should know the flow from here, right? Yeah. Cool. Status. Then I like did add the, the false name. Ah, uh, did add the the okay. status. Okay. So the did. Case sensitive. Oh, it's case sensitive. Okay. Nothing to change. I guess you committed already. Okay. So now your, oh, your wooden box is empty. Okay, log. Yep. So yeah. Okay, thank cool. you, man. Uh, anyone needs help? So like uh, add more lines to your name, comment that change, so that's the first item. Have you done that one? No. Like add more lines to the comment? Yeah, to the text file that you created just now. How do you do that? Um, so like open up the file in your favorite editor, add some lines and uh, comment that change. On your desktop. So, like, uh, do you remember where you ran the git init command? Like, uh, let me see where. Very far back. <laughs> okay, so you. S sorry? Yeah. So, I think you make a directory called my project. So, open it up. So, that's probably in your desktop, I imagine. Ah, there you go. 
Yeah, so you see that your file creator is there. Oh. Sorry? Yeah, you see the file. So this is after committing, so this is just still for us. Uh, sorry, what's the question again? If you commit it, it goes to the steel box. Yeah. Then you edit the one. <coughs> which one do you use? Just the steel one. Uh, I just can't. Okay, never mind. Uh, maybe we just try the first item. So like, we just add a bunch of lines. So like, maybe just open any random file. And just like add some lines to it. Yeah, sounds good. So maybe you wanna save that. So now, if, so like by saving it, we now have stuff in our carbon box, right? So if you run git status, okay. So now we see that there are two things here, right? So, uh, so apparently this is green, right? Which means that this is already in your wooden box. So I guess you did a git add, and now we have this one that's in your wooden box. So we, sh eh, sorry, this is in your carbon box. So let's just move that one to the wooden box. Yep, so now we can move everything to the steel box. Okay. Yeah, so that would be actually pretty much one and two in one go. <laughs> cool. Uh, anyone needs help? Yes. Sorry, we just came, so we yeah, totally sure. lost. Oh, okay, no worries. Uh, yeah, so just a quick run through. Have you installed Git? Uh, yeah. Okay, I see a VS Code already, so that's nice. Uh, so the first step is just like running through basic bash commands because like um, you'll be interacting with Git through uh, like the terminal. So like having this uh, in your tool set will be pretty nifty as well. So maybe we. Okay, so I guess you're using Windows, right? So maybe uh, you want to download it so you can load the GIFs. But um, sorry. What 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 what, what do you see yourself already? Oh, uh, okay, so like, are you familiar with like bash commands? No. <laughs> Alright, okay, so in that case, maybe you probably want to download the um, PowerPoint slide and then uh, load the GIFs. So the GIFs will like give you a demo of all the various commands. Oh, okay. But we can do it later. I'll just give a TLDR summary. Uh, so we can just keep oh. going forward. Yeah, so the TLDR, CD allows you to change between directories, LS um, allows you to list the directories. So the unlock for this is CD is like clicking on the folder in your um, file manager. LS is like what you see when you enter, like what you see on your right panel. And um, make directory is your new uh, folder command. Cat allows you to print the contents of a file. RM is your delete. RMRF, uh, sorry, RM-R uh, allows you to delete the folder. CP is your copy. MB is your move. Yeah, so that's just a high level description of the various commands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then the next bit is um, we talked about what Git is, and then um, here's some like, key concepts to take a note. First one is repository. Git here is a repository as a mapping of uh, a repo to a project. So each time you create a new project, you probably would create a new repo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so repos can live on your local machine, like your current laptop, and it can also exist on a remote server like GitHub. So that's the gist of it. The next bit is creating the actual Git repository. So you create your f your folder, you go into your folder, and then you run Git in it. So you always run Git in it in the folder that you want to be, that, that your repository will be. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so you do it through your terminal. Uh, can you, yeah, this one. How do you like? Okay, so currently you are SPWD. You're here, right? So maybe you're gonna cd into your desktop, and then maybe you create a new folder called project. Just like project. Uh, cd uh mkdir. Uh, mk mkdir, then your project name, like the the folder, like I don't know project for instance. Yep, perfect. So let's go into that project. So that's the which command? Uh, no, we're gonna go into it, right? So uh, that'll be the CD change directory. So CD, then what thing comes after it? Sorry? Uh, the name of the folder, right? Which is project. Yep. So let's do that. So you can press tab once you keyed in enough. Oh no, uh, type P first. Yeah, then tab. So it's like your autocomplete. 
yeah. Oh. So let's go in. Yep. So n this is where we want our repository to live, right? So now we call Git in it. So telling Git like, hey, I want this to be a Git repository. Oh. I don't know. Git in it. Space. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yep. Uh. Yeah. So now this is a repository. Oh. Yeah, then hopefully you can follow the rest of the slides. Oh. I don't really understand what, what does this do. Which one? Yeah, does it create another folder inside our desktop? Yeah, so it creates a hidden folder. So like that's how Git like, like sort of stores the data that it needs. You can only access the folder through Git. Um, not really. You can op like it's a dot folder, which means that it's a hidden folder. Like basically you shouldn't be touching it, but you can open it if you want to. But like you don't want to touch it unless you want to fuck it up. <laughs> You don't need to configure it every time. Oh uh, no. Uh, it's in like this bit, right? Yeah. Oh, it's a one-off thing. Okay. So I see you added your email and whatnot, right? Yeah. So it's a one-off thing. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yep. Yeah, pretty much. So that's the first two points, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, then maybe try to figure out the last one. Yes. I just want to ask that. Yeah. Like, uh, after I commit, like, how can I see what is in each commit? Like, what are the files that will change? Yeah. Those? Uh, uh, what are the um, You say, like, after we commit, like, what, what will happen you want after to change it? Okay, so let's say, like, this second commit, you want to make more changes to the second commit, right? Yeah, but I accidentally committed. Oh, okay. So usually the hack is, uh, um, it's called git commit uh, dash a. So git commit amend. So you can Google it, git commit amend. So it allows you to um, modify the last uh, commit that you've done. Oh, yeah. and, yeah, so what happens for the what happens to your file when you commit it? Like is it stored in some other place or? Yeah, so it's stored in so if you open up your 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 folder right, finder. Okay, so you see these files, right? So if I were to do this so the, the a flag means reviews everything, oh, right? So you, one, right? Yeah, so you see that there's this dot git that's hidden. Mm -hmm. So git tracks everything it needs in this particular folder. So each commit is stored in a hidden folder? Yeah, it's hidden somewhere. So it's all in here. I mean, like as far as the end users are concerned, we don't need to care. And like, in fact, you shouldn't touch that file unless you know, like, fuck everything up. Uh. <laughs> yeah, okay. So for, like, how do we revert it to a previous one if we, like... Just fuck it up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like, um, there are many ways, la. so one is, uh, we'll talk about it later, so one is you oh, check out, okay, that means you, then you then time travel or you git reset. Oh, yeah. so this one is just for local, right? Yeah, just oh, local. Oh, okay. So currently everything is local. Um, in the later part, we'll sort of like teach how you would sync it with a remote version. Okay, thanks. Yes. I'm getting this error when I'm running uh, a little bit behind, now. so um, I was running this one. Can you yeah. commit the, the first, oh wait, the first um, one? Oh, so, okay, so you need to run these two commands. Is it because uh, it's not synced with the. Oh, no, 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 like, So the thing is, uh, Git needs to know who you are and what your email address is. Uh, okay, so just yeah. put in the. Let me just run these two with. Yeah, with like whatever details you want to pass. Uh, similarly, similarly for mine, right? Yeah. I, I have to run these two commands as well. Uh, git reset author. Have you used Git on this laptop before? Uh, I downloaded files from Git before, GitHub, but I haven't used Git before. Uh, so I mean, it depends. Uh, from here, it says that your email is already set. Uh, so if you want, you can just do git config list. You do that git config dash dash list. Dash dash list. Uh, remove the space between dash dash. Yeah, press enter. Yeah, so like. Does this make sense to you? Where's your email? It's not there. Then I guess let's run the same commands as it says. Yeah, so then you will know your username and your address. Right, uh, has anyone like not done the first two bullet points yet? So I guess like for completeness, I just like demo the first two points. Lah. So the first one is uh, 
add some lines to your previously created text file and commit that change. So let's just do that now. Right, so let's. Right, so I made some changes. And it tells me that, oh, um, there's nothing in the wooden box. Let me add that in. And let me just commit that change. All right, so that's the first one. And the second one is add a new file, add some text, commit that change. So that's also pretty straightforward. I'll just create a new file. Let's open that. Let's call it the same thing. Perfect. Yep, so now I've like sort of done the first uh, two bullet points. First one being editing a file, saving that. Then the second one being creating a new file, adding new text, and saving that. Right, so is anyone not at that particular stage or like needs help? Yeah, so like ideally you should be really, really comfortable with like creating commits because like things can go a little bit faster after this one. So if any doubts, like now's the best time to ask. Anyone? Right, if not, then we'll move on to the third point, which is um, what is the reverse of a git add? So like, just a quick recap, when we do a git add, we're moving things from our cardboard box to the wooden box. So let's say like, hey, I don't want to do that. Um, how do I move it back to the cardboard box? So to demonstrate, let's say I do. So let's say I make some uh, text edits. I add the file, I git add the file. So notice that uh, it tells me that here I modified this file, it's in green. I don't want it to happen. And the hint is really here, right? Use git reset, hit file to one stage. Right, so we just take the hint. And it's just that, oh, unstaged changes. Unstaged means that, um, hey, it's no longer in the wooden box, it's now in our cardboard box. So in fact, if we go back here, we see that the file, sorry, the file is still in its previous state. We didn't undo the changes that we made. Oops. Yep. And it does that, that hey, the text is in here, which means that, oh, it's um, in our cardboard box. It's not in our wooden box. So with the git reset command, it actually moved it back to our cardboard box. So hopefully that solve, solves the last point. So we'll go more like in detail like what git reset is, but like this exercise that's like hopes to help you like discover new git features as you start using more and more of git. All right, so now that we sort of like covered the basics of git, we're now move on to GitHub. So this is probably like a term that you see floating around a lot in SOC, and so like what is GitHub? So GitHub is basically like the world's largest web-based git repository hosting service. Uh, it's owned by Microsoft, so it's huge. Uh, and you can think of it as a place where you can park your repositories online, even like show off your code or like collaborate with friends. And like its main purpose is really just for code collaboration. Like people can see your code, you can make contributions to code, so on and so forth. And it also adds like additional functionality on top of Git. So things like a really nifty UI, like interacting through a terminal is really lame. Uh, it also comes with like documentation. As yeah, your repository grows, you might add more documentation for people to see. That's one. It also contains things like uh, issues. So you can think of issues as like um, bug reports or like feature requests. And then there's this like uh, pull request and review, which is sort of like the workflow um, in incorporating changes into the repo and a lot more. So like uh, two new really nifty features that was added to GitHub was. Um, jump to definition, sometimes you look through code, you're confused as to what this function is. Uh, it can sort of help you jump to that definition and also can show you references of a particular like function. So think of this as, as like a, like an online text editor on steroids, if you will. All right, cool. So now, uh, I suppose that everyone has really created your GitHub account. If not, like really do so, it's very straightforward, it's free. And now let's actually create a new repository. So to do that, it's very simple. Once you are logged into your GitHub uh, account, you'll see this uh, green little button. Click on it, and then you fill up like some details. 
like the repository name, a description if, if you want it, and then um, the privacy settings. So like there are two versions. So the first one is public, meaning that everyone can see it, and private, which means that only, like, only you can see it. So for now, this set is like, public, nothing sensitive in it. And once you're done, you would sort of like reach this page with like a lot of like crazy commands. So like go ahead and create your repo and like as usual raise your hand if you're stuck. So like if you're unable to reach like the last stage, which is uh the one with all the crazy code, like as raise your hand it will come to you. Okay, maybe I'll just do a quick demo. So I logged in, let's create a new repo. So I give it a name. And I just click create repository. Right, so is anyone not at this particular page? Anyone? All right, so like assuming everyone has reached this page, we'll move on to the next step, which is uh, syncing your local repository with the uh, remote one. Yep. So this is what we call a push. So for now, um, we just sort of follow the instructions in the page. So here you see that there are two possible instructions to follow. So the first one is creating a new repository on the command line. We've already seen that, right? So hopefully all these commands sort of make sense. So we have to git init. So that's where you initialize the project. Um, here they're adding, <coughs> sorry, they created a file called readme.md in the previous step. Now we're adding it. So that's the whole moving into the wooden box thing that we've been hearing a lot. Then followed by a commit, which is the whole steel box thing. And then finally a remote add origin and a git push. So here is also the same thing, remote add and a git push. So how about we just run both of those in our terminal. So we just copy pasta this and run. And then we run this one too. So this one takes a while depending on your internet speed. And once uh, it's done, you'll see this branch master set up to track remote branch master from origin. So a lot of crazy terms flying around. Let's dissect it. So branch master is where we um, pre solve like the branch they're currently on. Master is always the default one. And then we see this track remote origin branch master and then from origin. So let's look at origin. So if you look at the preceding command, we did git at origin and then followed by this long crazy URL. Right, so you can think of origin as like an alias to the long crazy URL that we sort of keyed in just now. So TRDR, origin is the URL where your repo exists. And then remote branch master, you can think of it as like the remote branch. So um, you have your local branch and then your remote branch. So in this case, uh, coincidentally both are called master, but you can imagine a world where it might differ. But for now, like, we just go with the simple case where the local is called master and the remote one that's um, gonna 
be its online version, it's also called master. And then the last step, we did a git push. So that's sort of like pushing our local master branch to the remote master branch, such that both are now in sync. So you can think of that. You can think of the push step as like your sync command, if you will. So assuming that's done, we will now get, if you click refresh, you'll see that the files that you previously added are now reflected on your repo page. So if you have completed this step, congrats, you have actually successfully pushed code on the GitHub. So is anyone like not at this particular page yet? Yes. Oh, you can go to your GitHub page. Let's go down. Oh, I think, okay. Uh, okay, so the problem here is that you already added files here. So it's like, you can think of it as like this, your online version already has like moved forward okay. and your local one has moved in another direction. Okay. So you can't really merge the two anymore, right? So that's why it's throwing an error. So there are two things. Uh, one is like either um, you delete and create a new one. Okay. Actually, I think it's the best way. I just delete this one. Go to settings. Oh, actually, you can just, uh, mm, if you want, I can see the, uh, so is it, the yeah, because like your remote is now like in a different state, so it's like it's diverged, la, it gives like diverging timelines. Okay. Um, so I guess one thing you can do is you create a whole new project and you rerun the same thing. So I guess the first thing is you need to delete this, uh, delete this remote. So uh, okay, let's Google Git remove remote. Remote. Yeah, remote. Yeah. So let's see. Da -da -da -da. So, okay. So we will run Git remote rm origin. Because you obviously the origin, you're gonna undo that. RM origin. Okay. okay, so now let's go back to GitHub. Uh, this one. So maybe we just create a new project, just ignore this for now. Uh, yeah, just. Yeah, new repository that works too. Yeah. And just create yeah. it. Yeah, just create. Yeah, then rerun the same thing. Uh, it should work this time. Oh, uh, Juana. Okay, so like, did anyone initialize the repository with like this checked? Like, did anyone actually do this by accident? Okay, so things that you shouldn't, uh, because um, like what happens here is that if you choose to initialize your repository with readme, what it does is that Git would automatically create a new commit with the readme file. And the problem with that, right, is now you already had commits in your local repository. Now the remote also has commits. So you can think of it as like your timeline already diverging. So when you try to push your own um, commits up, Git doesn't know what to do and you receive this weird error. So like if you have encountered that weird error, like let us know and it'll help you resolve that. Sorry? Uh, yep, so like usually the error will tell you to pull first. So in that case, it does say that uh, how about you add the remote changes first and then you push everything up such that like you can resolve this weird divergence issue. Yeah, but um, TLDR is like, you would almost rarely uh, initialize it with readme, uh, because like, you just do everything locally first. But like, if you encounter this, uh, raise your hand, it will help you. Yeah. Uh, we did it, and then in, we gave up trying to do and create a new one. Oh, the repository is still. Oh, yeah, do the reading. The what? The reading thing. Um, 
Do it, make use of the uh No, but I mean someone else did it la. Oh yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, I think repository is still here. So what what do we do with it? You can delete it. Just delete it. Yeah, and then has it like affected the files on our computer? Uh it won't because it's all online. Yeah. Okay, okay. So we can just make a new repo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah. Let's just let's just get everything onto online. So the does it actually change anything? Like Which one? I mean does it uh screw up anything? Uh, it only screws up if we key in the code. Key in the code. So, what's the whole question again? Uh, uh, it, it, I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, uh, so, you said that it will screw up if you if you take the box, right? So, is it only if you take the box and you key in the code that you show it now that it will screw up? Yeah, because um, what happens is like the online version has its own commit, okay. and then like your it's local version has its own set of commits, and like they are okay. divergent. So, when you try to push yours up, it gets like, oh, shit, I can't do this, and shows an error. Oh, okay, okay, I get that. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a good question, right? Yeah. So, uh, when you do when you do git push, right? Yeah. Origin, right? What does the origin mean? So origin is the it's like the alias to the URL uh, of where your the own, own yeah like the GitHub repo. That's the URL. So instead of typing the whole thing, just uh, tag the alias, which is origin. The GitHub repo that means it's uh, my own. Uh, that means if I if I go to the GitHub.com, it means it's you know, GitHub.com slash whatever, right? Yeah. So like for example that one, uh. So that. So. So actually, if I don't type origin, what what do I type? <coughs> if let's say I don't want to type origin, then that means I have to type the entire link to code. Uh, okay. I think that will work. Yeah. I must type the entire. That means. Like HTTPS GitHub.com and the whole thing, uh. That means his. That means if let's say I want to push to his, and I. Push to this, then I'll write his entire link by his origin, right? Uh, in that case, you can add a different remote, so you could call it like instead of origin, call it friend, and then like you'll be git push friend. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. okay, so I must add a remote to that to that link itself, right? Yeah, okay. Then the last thing is, as I say, if you see it, if you see it, right? So, yeah. what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the example that you said again? What do I do to okay? So, like, like. Do you know why there's a problem now, right? Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, I so understand. now what we want is, uh, in order for us to push, we need to resolve the conflict, right? So right. it tells us to git pull. So git pull means, okay, I'm going to pull the updates that was made on the so online just version. Tell me what to do. I know okay, what so do. git pull, and then uh, git commit, and then git push. So just pull first. Yeah. But then, uh, you, you, because currently, you that means the repo is already there, right? Yeah. And then you have a local repo. So you are trying to the initial step is that because that repo is blank, you just sync directly to that, right? Yeah. But now is that you must actually pull first to your local. Yeah. Then after you pull to your local, then you push upwards to everything push into it, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is anyone still stuck in this like weird state because of like this checkbox? Exactly here. I mean, what's in the bracket exactly? Oh, so master is like the so no master bas basically means like the branch they're currently on. So like by default, your branch will be master. So when we start introducing branching workflows, yeah. it might change based on like what branch you're checking out. And that will show on the GitHub. Uh, so GitHub will track all your branches. And separate it accordingly. Yeah, separate accordingly. So like this one is just sort of like telling you where so you currently are. Which one directory you mean? Uh, yeah, so if you open the directory, like you wouldn't really know which branch you're on. Uh, but how git knows, right, is um, there's this hidden file called .git. So .git tracks what you're doing. And like the main reason why, like in this case, it shows all this, right, because like this was, uh, this is sort of like developed by git, right? So like it actually reads the .git folder and gives you all these like nice things. If you open the same thing in your, um, your Windows terminal, right, the uh, command prompt, you will not have that. Yeah. Okay, so can I safely assume that everyone's on this state? Like, 
if you do access your repo page, it has all the commits they have fed. All right, let's take it as a yes. So, um, yeah, so you can sort of see like how this uh, Git repository sort of is a carbon copy of what I've been working on so far. You see that there's only one branch, which is uh, master, which makes sense. That's the default one. And you can also see other nice things, like your commits. Like in this case, I have three. Um, so you'll sort of notice that the hashes here are pretty much the same as the one in my local. Oops. Yeah, so observe that the commits are pretty much the same, right? In this one, we have 8C, 9C, 8C, 9C, 663, and 564. All of them match up. So if we can see how this is like a common copy of the, the local repository that we have here. Right, so let's keep moving on. So now that like, you have successfully um, sort of synced your code with the online repo, it's a good time to introduce uh, two new concepts, which is like pushing and pulling. So notice, um, so we haven't done pull yet, but what we've done previously was a push. So push is basically adding your local changes to the remote repository. So just now, how do we get our changes onto the GitHub repo? We did a git push. Make sense? And then the um, sort of converse would be a git pull. So you can imagine a world where um, you have multiple computers, you made some changes on computer A, you pushed it, and then now you move on to uh, computer B. So computer B is out, is sort of like behind, um, sort of behind the time, and to make it um, sync, you then do a git pull. So in that case, you pull the changes from the remote repository into your local repository. So push and pull. So you can imagine as uh, if you're working on projects that had that has like multiple collaborators, you'll be doing a lot of push and pulling. All right, so now let's move on to slightly more fancy stuff. So we'll first uh, sort of look into uh, branching and merging, followed by uh, sort of like merge conflicts, and then we'll sort of end off with like creating your first like uh, merged pull request. All right, so now we'll look into uh, branches and what they are. So branches is really like the killer feature of Git. Um, various uh, like competitors of Git does support branches, but it's usually at a very high cost because of like some of the internals and whatnot. But here they are. Branches allows you to like diverge from, diverge from the main line of development. So for example, let's say you're working on some website, you want to test out some new possible workflow. So instead of like um, sort of making your changes to master, which would sort of like affect the state of like the active project, what you do is you create a new branch, you make your changes, and those changes will be independent of the main line development. And once you're happy with like your work, you then merge it back in with the master. So like that whole process that I described just now is what we call the branching workflow. Where you branch off, work on your stuff. Once you're happy with it, you then merge it back. Yep, so with that, uh, there's a quick recap. Master is really like the main branch of your project. So in an ideal world, like you shouldn't be sort of like making commits on master, but instead on your own branch, and then merge it when you're done. Yep, so I went ahead of myself just now. When you're done with your work, you just merge it back to master. So I guess one interesting point here is that when you do a merge, you'll create a whole new commit which is here. So you can imagine like, for example, let's say your master has two commits, your uh, feature branch has these three. When you merge together, there'll be a whole new commit that's created. And we'll also like demonstrate that a bit later. So now let's actually create a new branch. So the syntax for that is the git checkout dash b followed by the branch name. So what checkout is, we will sort of go into that a bit later. But for now, we just memorize that when you want to create a new branch, you just call git checkout dot b. And then once you're done, you can run the git branch command to see like all of your branches. So I just like quickly demonstrate that. So notice that it created a new branch and it checks it out. So I'm currently in my branch. I'm no longer in master. And if I do a git branch, So it, <clears throat> it shows uh, two lines, first one being master, and then the second one being my branch. So notice that there's an asterisk here indicating that like, hey, I'm in my branch. But like, um, if you're using like the git console windows, it'll probably really tell you that you're on my branch. And like, my terminal is also set up to reflect that as well. So I guess one uh, another important thing to note is that because I did a like branching from where I previously was, the current state of the project is identical to where like it was previously when I was still on master. Make sense? 
All right, cool. Okay, so now the next step is to sort of like, like develop our new branch. So like at your own time, just make a bunch of random commits. And then once you're happy with it, we will then push that branch onto our remote repository. So once you have pushed this um, branch, and um, you go into your GitHub repository, you now see that there'll be two branches. First one being master, which we pushed just now, and the second one being the new branch that we just pushed. So let's do that. Yep, so in this case, I just make a bunch of uh, extra lines. Let me just commit that. Okay. So if you wanted to actually see the git log, and we now see a bunch of like really colorful text. So now observe that um, the head now points to my branch. As we sort of mentioned previously, head is sort of like where you currently are right now. And because we made this commit on my branch and not on master, we observe that master is now here, which is like one commit behind us. And um, an added bonus here is that um, Git also tells us where the origin master is currently pointing at. And you can sort of see like how both are like at the same place, which means that like our local master and the GitHub's um, version of master are in sync. So is anyone like not at this like particular state yet? So assuming that you are, um, go ahead and push this particular branch uh, up to your GitHub repository. So the way to do that uh, is readjust this command, git push origin and the branch name. So let me just do that. All right, cool. So once that is done, I can go back to my main repo. And you would, so you see a couple of things. So the first one, you sort of see this like weird uh, yellow dialog box. And if I click on branch, I'll now see that there are two branches. So like if everything went well, like you sort of see this. If not, let's raise your hand and help you. Okay, so is anyone not at this state? If not, we can move on to the like the whole merging process. Here, right? So you get pushed origin my branch. So that's basically saying, hey, uh, GitHub, uh, hey, get pushed my branch up onto the online repository. And what the online repository is, it's origin. Okay, so, um, so like, how do I add things inside here? I'm supposed to create other commands. So, what things do you mean? Like, so, I think you already done that, right? For them, they have like five bars. Oh, so I mean, this is like random Like it depends on what changes you made, uh, So like, uh, it would so depend. So now I make like no changes. Um, so you have. So notice that here you already checked out of my branch. Yeah. 
So that's so you notice that this master and my branch, yeah. and then you made a commit here, and then the commit looks like it went through. So because of that, my branch is now actually a master. Oh. Makes sense, right? Because like we we branched out, and then we made a commit. So master is here, my branch is here, okay. and now I'm pushing this onto GitHub. So GitHub now knows. So GitHub now has like two branches, right? Master and your my branch. So if I make changes to my branch, it will be like part of the master. No, it will be in my branch. Alright, cool. I just assume that everyone has like successfully pushed their branch on GitHub. So now, assuming that we're happy with the changes they were made, right? We we'll now go ahead with the next step, which is to merge all these changes into master. So there are usually two ways of doing it. So one is either you do it uh, locally, which we'll do a bit later. But for now, we'll just demonstrate how you go about doing that online. So if you go into your GitHub repo page, you'll see this particular button called Compare and Pull Request. So we'll just click on that. That sort of like kicks off um, the whole merging process. So what happens here is, um, so this is like a GitHub specific thing. Uh, we then fill up this particular form. Like the title will be maybe just add more text. And then here you just like describe your stuff. And from here you can sort of see a summary of the changes they are proposing. So in this case, I see that I remove this line and I add a bunch of these other lines. Yep, so you can imagine as like, as you do more fancier like branches and whatnot, all the changes will be reflected at the bottom. And suppose that you're happy with this change, you then click the create pull request. So like why it's called a pull request, hopefully you can see why that's the case a bit later. But for now, we just treat it as it is. So in this case, uh, once you sort of created the pull request, you will reach this page. So once again, uh, it gives a pretty good summary of the commits that you're proposing. So in this case, I only made one commit. So it makes sense that the log here only shows one. And we see that there are um, <coughs> we can see what files that will change this particular tab, and assuming that I am happy with this, I'll then just click on the merge pull request. So maybe just a uh, quick recap. So observe that here I'm adding a bunch of uh, text here, right? So notice that this is called branching text. And if I look at master, where I expect to see like that branching text to appear in master? No, right? Because we already branched out. So in fact, that is definitely reflected here. Da, 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 new file. So he, see, in this case, it's different, right? This only contains the text that was previously set as it were in master. So let's see some magic happen. So in this case, suppose I'm happy with everything. I merge the pull request. In this case, um, it says that it's merged. So not like here, what's happening here is that I'm merging uh, into master this particular branch that I created just now called my branch. So once I have done this and I see this purple button, basically means that my branch has now been merged onto master. So now that that's done, do you think that master has changed? Do you think that the state of master has changed after you've done the merge? Makes sense, right? So if you go back to our Git repository, so this was on master. Okay, so you can definitely see it here, right? The URL says blob and then master, telling us we're on a master branch. And if you refresh it, boom, you see that the change was made. So once you finish with the steps, congrats, you made your first um, branch merge, but online, which is even cooler. Okay, so now, a uh, quick question. So uh, as far as GitHub's concerned, this is how a master looks like. But how would master look like on our local repo? Will we still get these texts? Like, will this appear in our master version? Okay, so in my branch, let me go back to master. Okay, back to master. Boom, the text disappeared. What happened? Like, why is my master here different from the master on GitHub? Anyone knows why? Yeah, because we're out of sync, right? The remote repository is now ahead of the local one. So how do we sync things up? What command comes to mind? Any idea? So we have push and pull, right? So which one should it be? 
Any ideas? So push move things up, right? So the opposite would be pull, right? Yep. So now if I want my master to be up to date, I'll then do a git pull. Oops. So make sure you check out your master first and then do a git pull. Yep, and no, in this case, notice that, hey, uh, the new file has indeed changed. And if I go back to subline, I reload it, and boom. We're now in this happy state where everything is in sync. So if you run the same commands on your laptop, and like if you're not in the state where your local master is in sync with your remote master, which will help you out. Looks like it's working, but it says everything is up to date, and it doesn't actually merge mm. here. So there's still two branches. Mm -hmm. Um. So what? How do you get? It's like you try out the merge conflict there, is it? Yeah, but like merge, merge what? I mean, there's no specification. What do I merge? I mean, merge like file name, merge the branch, or what? Everything is up to date. Uh, git merge master. Da -da 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 Oh, okay, so um, how the git merge command works is um, this is the sort of branch that you're merging into. Into? Yeah, in this case, what hap what's happening here is you're trying to merge master into BBC, mm -hmm. which um, would probably work, right? Because like BBC was uh, branched off master. Mm -hmm. So, as far as like um, BBC is concerned, like, there's nothing new from master to merge into. So, I guess what you probably want is to check out master and then merge BBC in. Does that, does that make sense? In both branches. But like the one BBC is new and there's like more that. Yep, yeah, so I, I can imagine like you want master to now have the changes that were done in BBC, right? Yeah. Yep, so for you to do that, you need to check out master first and then run um, git, bra uh, git merge uh, BBC. It says which branch to get master and then. Uh, okay, so the first thing I'll do is uh, git check out master. So go to master. And then, yeah, then uh, git branch, eh, sorry, git merge BBC. Ah, okay. yep. So what happened previously is you're trying to merge like changes in master into BBC, which wouldn't really do anything because BBC is ahead of master, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so like uh, TLDR, like when you call your merge command, chances are you want to be in master. Yeah, unless like there are changes in master that you want on BBC. Going to the wrong, wrong direction. Sorry? So it was basically just trying to go from the wrong direction. Wrong direction. Um, from the one ahead of master. I'm um, not so sure about the directions per se, but like the whole basis of merging is like like um, some branch that I'm working on has changes that I want in my current branch. Yeah. So like in our case, um, BBC has moved ahead of master. So let's say I want the changes on BBC or master. I'll then um, do a git merge BBC from master. So that's one case. So another possible case. So, so I'm jumping the master branch into BBC, but not uh, vice versa. Vice versa is basically the word. That one is already ahead. Yeah. So you can imagine another world where, like, let's say I'm making changes on BBC. Mm -hmm. Like my friend makes changes on master. So I'm master moves forward, and I want BBC to have these changes on master. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll do a git pull so that master's up, my local master's up to date, mm -hmm. and then. To get these changes on my BBC branch from BBC, I'll then do git merge master. Mm -hmm. So now BBC moves ahead and has the same changes that were on master. Mm -hmm. 
but master remains unchanged. As in like, it's my friend's version, but this master doesn't have the BBC stuff. Mm -hmm. Make sense? This is like what I did, but mm -hmm. it didn't work because there was nobody else changing the curve. Yeah. Um, that would be correct, but like I would refuse to push because like push means something else in Git. Yeah, uh, merge, uh, it will merge. Overwrite what has changed. So like um, so the second half, which is like in second different branch, it won't change. Yeah. So that's why I call like a merge free conflict. But you can imagine a world where like both branches touch the same line of code. Then Git would be like, oh, I don't know what to do. Then it will throw what's called a conflict. And then like we'll sort of cover that a bit more later. Is anyone still stuck? Like I assume that everyone has like managed to merge their branch online and has it synced in their local repository, right? All right, cool. Then I'll just move on. All right, so we've done this step. Yep. So just now we sort of uh, use this command called the git checkout, and what it does is it this basically sort of allows you to sort of switch between like different versions of a target entity. So in terms of entity, there are sort of like two kinds, right? So the first one is uh, branch, which was the one that we used just now when we sort of switch between master and my branch. So if you want to go to master branch, I'll just do git checkout master. If you want to go to my branch, it'll be git checkout master. So on top of just checking out branches, I can actually check out specific commits. And um, that's pretty useful if I want to do like so-called time travel. You can imagine a world where you're making some changes, you know, this a bug appears, and then you want to sort of like go back in time and see like when did that bug actually appear, so to speak. So one way of doing that oops, is to just call the git log and then like sort of figure out which commit do you want. So for example, in this case, uh, I want to check out this particular commit and I'll just do this git checkout. So in this case, now it tells me that my head is now in this particular commit and if I open up Sublime, you'll see that the state of the world is like where it was when I made that comment. So notice there's this warning called detached hit. So why that's the case is um, like it's pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, self it says that we can move around, make changes, but um, you have to be a bit careful because now we're moving back in time, right? If you make any changes, um, Git doesn't really know how to track that. So it tells us that if you want to make any changes, be sure to uh, create a new sort of like branch. So like that creates a pointer which will then point to the changes they made. So there's that. That's a pretty advanced use case. Let's not really go too much into detail for that. And there's also um, this particular fancy term which is uh, git checkout branch slash commit and file name. So that allows you sort of like restore the previous version of a file. And that's like pretty nifty if you just wanted to sort of like pull an, ex an old version of a file. So an example would be like, same thing, you're doing some um, bug fix, and then like, you figure out maybe like the source was, sorry, like maybe you're fixing some bug, and you figure out that like, hey, the code is actually working like maybe five comments ago. So let me just check out that particular version of that particular file. So to do that, uh, let me just go back to master. All right, so my new file is back where it previously was. So imagine, uh, just now I was checking out this particular commit, uh, 8C9. Let's say I only want the, the new text file. I just want the older version of the new text file. So the command I'll use is just git checkout, the commit name, oops. The commit name, and then the file name, which is this new file. So open up, it's now where, <coughs> so once I sort of like check, uh, checked out a particular file, the file is sort of like, 
it will sort of be like the state of where that commit was, and I'm still actually in master. So in this case, I sort of like copy and I sort of like yanked out the previous version of the file, but I'm still on master. And because like this is sort of like a change, in some sense of the word, um, it's now in our cardboard box. Oh, sorry. In this case, it actually moves it to a wooden box. Sorry, but notice that we're still on master. Yeah, so this is like an example of how you might check out previous version of the file, just to sort of like concretize everything. In this case, I have uh, a file with three lines, which corresponds to three old commit, uh, three particular commits. I check out a previous version, and then now when I reload the file, I realize that oh, I'm back in the older version of the file. So that's how you might go about checking out a previous version of a file. All right, so the next bit is uh, merge conflicts. So just now when we did the online merge conflict, it was very straightforward because we're only like appending files to the end, right? So you can imagine in a more complicated project, people will be making changes to like various parts of the project. Chances are uh, you and your friend are going to touch the same line. So when you do the git merge, what happens is that git is going to like scream at you, right? Because it doesn't know whose change to take. So in that case, it would fail and throw what's called a git conflict, uh, a merge conflict. So this is sort of like a very simple example. You can imagine uh, a project where we have a text with four lines of code. And then um, on, mas on this particular branch, or like the master branch, the second line is changed. Oh, sorry, this is oh, the conflict-free version, my bad. So uh, in the happy path, what happens is you can imagine in a world where you have a file with four lines, um, this particular branch changes line two, this particular branch changes line four. And when I merge the two together, git sort of knows how to add the two, right? Because both branches were touching different lines of the file, and the merge process is very straightforward. So this is pretty much uh, similar to what we did just now when we merged our files online. We only added like lines at the end of the file, so Git sort of knew how to merge it. So this is like the happy path, which happens probably like 1% of the time. 99% of the time, what's going to happen is that you and your friend are going to be touching the same lines of the code. So in this particular example, uh, this particular branch is um, touching the third line like so. So instead of the letter 3, we get 2 plus 1. And in this particular branch, it's changing it to 1 plus 2. So when I do a git merge, it shouts at me saying that, hey, um, I can't merge, there's a clash. And when I open the file, I get this uh, crazy lines. So what happens here is that the area of conflict would be wrapped with these uh, angle brackets. The top half would be hit, which is the current branch I'm at. And the lower half would be the branch that I'm trying to merge into. So maybe you can try to run this example through. So what I do is I create a new file. Right, so this is the current file. So let me just do this. Okay, then I'll just commit this. Oops. All right, so this is pretty much this particular state. So now let me just branch out first. So my new branch, in this case, I would change this particular line. sense so um, is everyone sort of like lost okay so like uh, to recap what happens is that I first at master I create a new file called text.txt I create four lines of co uh, four lines so the first one being one two three and four in like spelling form so now I'm trying to do here is I trying to like simulate a uh, merge conflict so you can imagine a world where like I'm gonna create a branch and then I modify the third line. So you can imagine like this is uh, me, I'm at branch A, I changed line three like so. Then at the same time, someone on master makes a change. So master's three, you imagine some guy actually did this. Make sense? So now master is like this, 
run this like this. So one thing will happen if I were to do this. It would fail, right? Because both branches, master and A, have touched line tree. Git wouldn't know which one to use. So if I run this, you tell me there's an error, right? And if I open this up, I'll get like all these crazy lines and whatnot. So like if you're using a decent editor, it'll probably like colorize it for you and like come out with like nifty UIs. But um, for now, it is what it is. And basically, what I have to do is I just have to sort of like resolve anything that's in this chunk of text. Is anyone is everyone able to sort of like reach this particular state? Like if you lost this reason, I anyway, help you. So like, um, like create your branch A, make some changes, and at the same time make some changes on, ma on your master. And then once you're done, uh, try to merge branch A into master, and you should ideally reach this particular merge conflict page. Like if not, then like uh, raise your hand will help you. Okay, so like who has uh, reached this particular like? Like you can see all these like crazy angle brackets. Who has already reached this? No one? Yep. Hi. Um sir, well this point you're at trying to do it. Text editor when you would update your version and line, it would update the text editor. Uh, yep. Um, I thought that was cool, and I was trying to do it too. <laughs> oh, are you using Vim or? Like I was using Notepad, but I've also got the ones you recommended to download. Um, anyway, so now I changed to my. I went back. Mm -hmm. It's easier if I show you. Um, I was like, all right, whatever. I'll get this commit ID. Um, Check out that ID. It's mm -hmm. my project. Um, I got it. I opened it. It was blank, mm -hmm. just like when I opened it. Um, then it's still there. I tried to restore it back to my current project. I didn't change anything. I just was trying to have a look and go back. But when I opened it again, it's still the same. It's still blank. So how do I go back? Because that should have about three lines in it, but it don't. So. So when were the three lines added? The three lines were added, added one line in here, okay. or there, and then I added like <coughs> another line there, oh, okay. not the top one. Da, da, da. So, so in this case, like you checked out um, this part, so that's probably when the file was still empty, right? Yep. Yep, so in this case, you want to undo like, the whole checkout this file, right? Do I have to just manually go back to the uh, so like in this case, use a, a git reset. So um, you probably want to reset hard. So reset dash dash hard. So that's like that will basically wipe everything, like all, all the changes they made up until the last commit. So now if you were to cat the file, cat or can I? Yeah, this works too. Yeah, then the there we are. Okay. Yeah. Huh. And so that normally updates. So if I had that open, which I did. Um, that would automatically track on my local I system? I think it depends on the text editor. But most of them usually come up where like, if it changes outside and you <coughs> bring the text editor in focus, it'll probably give you a warning dialog saying like, hey, the file changed, would you like to reload it? Yeah, most editors should do that. If not, then that's kind of dangerous. <laughs> okay, then, so then how... Do you have a question? I mean, yeah, yeah, I thought you were done. No. So... Um, okay, no, now I, I'm good. I'll make another branch. I'll try and do this now. Awesome. Um, then I'll ask you for help when I get stuck. So cool. how do I understand what this means? All right, cool. So um, anything that's between the a the arrow brackets are like where it gets um, sort of like screening, right? Just it doesn't know. Just like
like how to apply the change. So whatever that's above this eco line is the state of the world, which is like the branch you're currently on. Master, and then this is the income branch. So in a way, yeah. So you can imagine like let's say we're here, and we need a get merge A. So anything that's below the like whole line of eco signs would be from branch A, and then this is um the current branch you're on. So instead of um. Like most editors will call this the current change, and this is the incoming change. Mm -hmm. So like your goal now is to assume it is to sort of like resolve should actually be between these two angle brackets. So do I just like type it manually, or is there a way to like say which branch is more oh, that's a priority? So you use like more uh, fancy text editors like VS Code. Like there will be like sort of buttons where you can choose like accept incoming change, accept VS current code. change. Oh, so like you can open it up, and then it will probably show it for you. So now you see you have a bunch of buttons, right? So accept current change, accept incoming change, and accept move. The current change, which is it, is this is incoming. So in this case, like suppose, like wherever it's uh, on the uh, top half, and let's click on current change. So we click on that one, everything below here will vanish. Yeah, oh, this one, these buttons. So you can try, you can, you can uh, click on this one, the green one stays, and then if I control Z, Control Z, yeah, then I can choose uh, the second half. So this will keep the second half. Yep. Then you control Z that back. Imagine a world where like we want both, so we click both. You will take both, and then like you will just manually edit it yourself. Should I mean demo that? Uh, you can only merge one, so you only have two. It's like you can only like merge a branch into your current branch. Like you can't really like merge multiple at the same time. Yeah, but it, like suppose like let's say I have master, I have branch A, branch B, and branch C. So let's say I merge all of them into master. I'll do it one at a time. Like you can't like get merge all three at the same time. Like that that construct doesn't exist. Two questions. Can you make a branch off a branch? Yes. Cool. Um, and if you have like a hundred lines of code and you've got some stuff around line thirty, mm -hmm. but then because you add more stuff before line thirty, it like pushes the text around even though it's the same text. Mm -hmm. Would that still become a conflict? Um, so it depends on, okay, so in an ideal world, no. So you can imagine like a world where you have like, let's say four paragraphs with like a bunch of lines in between. And imagine like uh, in branch A, I add a new paragraph here. Yeah. And in branch B, I add a new paragraph here. So in that case, because like there's no sort of like marking around in like both areas of changes, um, Git is usually speed to resolve that, so. Okay, so even if like these two are pushed down past where that one would be, yeah. it would still recognize where it is. Pretty much. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it's, like it really depends on like how smart Git is. Like it depends on the underlying algorithm. But in most cases, it will probably figure out that it's fine or it's like it's safe to do so. Yeah. Cool. That's a promote clean program. Uh, clean in a way because <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> like it does some like uh sort of like greedy matching. So it tries to like match as many like um unchanged codes as possible. Yeah. So I think that's like how it works under the hood. Fancy stuff. <laughs> Um, is anyone still not at this particular state? So like, if you're using VS Code, you might like sort of see this uh, fancy text. Yep, so like if you're using VS Code, you actually get like a pretty fancy color highlighting. So in this case, uh, VS Code is smart enough to realize that, oh, there's a conflict in this file. And it actually like sort of like highlights um, the areas of conflict. And then you get a bunch of buttons 
uh, I get buttons, yep. So you get a bun bunch of buttons which sort of like helps you decide how to resolve this conflict. So in this case, we have, uh, it's appeared again. So in this case, I have accept current change, accept incoming, and accept both. So maybe let's break this down first. Uh, so what happens is um, anything that's um, between the angle brackets, the opening and the closing one, is where the area of conflict is. And we sort of, so what Git does for us is that it sort of splits in half. What's on top is um, the head, or aka the current change. So this is sort of like the state of the text on our current branch. And the bottom half is sort of the incoming change, which is like the branch we're trying to merge into. So usually we are presented with like two options, accept current. So that would sort of accept what's on the top half of the uh, like line of equal signs or the divider. So if I click on this one, notice that it will keep one plus two and it will remove the two plus one. So two plus one is at the bottom. I want the top one. So if I click on this one, it keeps the top one. And the angle brackets are gone, meaning that the conflict's resolved. So suppose I don't want that one, I want the one at the bottom, which is the change that I'm trying to merge into. I'll click on incoming change. In this case, it will keep the second one, and then I'll get two plus one. Suppose like, I want a mix of both, or like instead of one plus two, I want one plus one plus one. So in that case, I can just do accept both changes, which gives me both, and then I can sort of like manually change it myself. Oops. Yep. So like if you use a smart editor, it's all these like fancy tools that you sort of like resolve things. And in this case, like let me just uh, pick the current change. And then once I sort of resolved it, I'll just do uh, git status. It tells me that, uh, so I get all this like weird text because like, git sort of knows that I'm in a state of a merge conflict and it's telling me to this, uh, if I want to abort, I just do git merge abort. So in this case, I'll be back to master, no changes were made. But if I'm happy with the current state of the world, I'll just do a git add. So that's like the whole moving things into the wooden box analogy all over again. So suppose I want to do that. Do a git add, and then text or txt, and then um, once I'm done, I do a git commit. So in this case, uh, it would then generate the merge uh, commit, and once I'm happy with that, I'm done. So that's how you go about resolving conflicts. Anyone lost? Anyone not lost? <laughs> All right, so the question is, can you do it without VS Code? Uh, yes, you can. So it'll pretty much be what we saw uh, here, right? So like, you just manually edit this. Um, in fact, if you're using a like, decent text editor, like, you'll usually come with all this like, uh, nifty UI that helps you resolve these conflicts. Uh, but if you don't want to, you can just DIY it. Uh. But basically, like, all these crazy angle brackets is just to tell you like, where the merge conflicts are. And like, you just have to remove all of them to like, carry on. Like in fact, you can even keep it there. You can even like uh, just uh, shove everything into the wooden box and commit it. Just that like all these disgusting looking angle brackets will be in your code and like you'll probably break things. So like hopefully you're able to like replay this whole like merge conflict process. And like if you have problems, let's raise your hand, we'll help you. Yes. So I basically what I did is just I, I tried to I I created the branch already. Yeah. So now I'm trying to commit the commit the exchange. But then uh, basically when I, I try to commit it. Yeah, so it's unchecked, right? Which means that all these things are in your cardboard box. So yeah, you can't commit anything because your wooden box is empty. So like, we should move things to the wooden box. Okay. So like, uh, I have to process. Like, how, how do we? Yeah. Uh, adding it on which branch? Is it my branch, or uh, yeah, yeah. Mm, so you're currently in branch A, so yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. So it's all being in branch. A. Is that my branch now? Is that a folder? No, my branch is, is the branch from the, from the previous exercise. What? Yeah, I'm not sure. Like okay, I think yeah. this is probably a folder. It looks like a folder. <laughs> LS. Let's run LS. 
Yeah, you create a uh, my branch. Yeah, so like like uh, you can keep it as it, as it is lah. But um, you yeah, I can move it. So RM uh, it's a it's gonna work. You need to add a dash R. Okay, cool. If you do LS it. You LS it should be gone. Okay, then if you do git status, I think you shouldn't get any more red. Yeah, perfect. Then you can commit. Were you able to replicate the whole like merge conflict thing? Uh, I was having trouble with this thing because oh. actually I I I did it on a on a different of text for PHP. Okay. So I don't want, but it it give me this 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 issue about the resolve. So I if I just commit the default, then I should be able to continue with the with the text. Yeah, sure. Awesome. <coughs> Alright, cool, we're almost at the end. Uh, anyone still needs help? Cool, I'll just uh, push through. We only have like two more subtopics left and we're almost more or less done. All right, so next bit is like undoing local changes. So previously we've been talking about like how do you like commit, 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 right? So like how do you like undo? So if you like sort of like fudge things up, how do you undo your changes? So for that we have the git reset command. So notice that like uh, just now in the sort of like the break portion, or, like three questions, the last one being how do you move things from the wooden box back to the cardboard box? And the answer to that was the git reset command, right? So now we're sort of like uh, expanded that a little bit more. And um, we noticed that like for git reset, there are three different flags. So we have hard, mixed, and soft. Uh, mixed isn't very important. Chances are you only be using uh, hard or soft. So the best way to think about it right, is that um, the flags sort of like determine like the impact of the uh, reset command. So soft only sort of like affects the hit. So it means that it sort of like affects like, as far as git's concerned, like which um, commit you're pointing at. So you can imagine, um, yeah, I'll go into more details there later. But okay, so soft only affects the head, which is like you're pointed to the um, commit. Uh, mix, not super important, uh, but it affects not just the head, but the index. And hard just like nukes every damn thing. So like TLDR, like if you feel that your code is like beyond repair, give reset hard is probably the best way forward. So let's look into a soft reset. So a soft reset allows you to sort of like rewind a repo to a specific commit. So like you can imagine a world where you made like three commits, you're three commits deep, you realize that you fucked up and you want to go back. So to do that, um, we we'll use git reset and then um, hit followed by tilde. So tilde is like the minus operator. Yep, and uh, also good to note that uh, the default flag is soft. So if you do not specify like whether it's mix or is a hard, git is going to assume soft. So in this example, suppose I call git reset hit one, I'll go back one commit, which means that it would undo the last commit. Uh, not undo, sorry. It moves the pointer back to the last commit. Your previous commit still exists in some form, but it might get removed eventually. Then like um, by sort of like induction, uh, if you tilde two, it means you go back two commits. Uh, so to go in front, So to do that, you need the commit ref. So like for example, let's say like I'm here, so I'm in, in the screen point, I'm gonna go back to this one, right? So um, that is kind of tricky <laughs> because like you can't really um, get this anymore, but if you use this thing called a git reflock, uh, it sure tells you like which commits you're at and then uh, you can actually go back. But TRDR, you can't, so like not a good idea. But in any case, because it's git uh, reset soft, right? It's a soft, um, Reset. What happens is that the index is unchanged, the working di directory is unchanged. So as far as Git's concerned, the safe has been sort of like touched, but your working directory has not. So like you haven't really undone any changes in the directory. Sorry. So the question is, have I pulled the working directory? Um, there's no push or pulling concerns. It's more like you can think of uh, every commit as like um, sort of like moving things into the safe. So what a Git reset does is it pulls those things out of the safe. But like, it'll be sort of like moved back onto your, your various boxes. So, um, the question is for this one, right? Yeah. When you hit reset, right, are you doing it on your main file or are you doing it on your main file? 
Also, the question is when you git reset, is it on your local or on your remote, right? So, um, like you usually run your machine, so it's local. So until you push anything, right, it will not be uh, reflected on your um, remote. Yeah, it's only happening locally. Yeah, so in fact, like, uh, if you do something funny like git reset and then push, right, you'll probably fail because, like, this is whole divergent thing, right? Yeah, so, like, just be careful when you're doing all these, like, soft resets. Any other questions? Sorry? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah so, so the question is, what, what if I were to sort of run this command, git reset tilde 1, followed by git reset tilde 2. So when I run the first one, suppose I'm here, I'll go back 1, so that's the first command. If I run it, if I run tilde 2, I'll go back 2, so I'll end up here. Like, hopefully I answer your question. Yep, so like, you can, I guess like, sort of like briefly demo that. So notice that in the previous commit, I made So if I did a git reset. Wait, okay, so uh, nothing changed because like, I, I picked my head, right? So if I were to do it again, what do you think will happen? So the change prior to this was I renamed a uh, tree in spelling into the, like, the formula form, right? So I have to run this. Let's uh, do this. So uh, let me just create two commits first. Uh, so this one. Okay, then I create another one. All right, cool. So now let me just do a git reset. Yeah, so in this case, uh, why we didn't really see any changes in the file is because notice that uh, if you go back to this diagram, like the impact of soft is really only the head, which is like the safe, so to speak, right? So notice that index is unchanged, working directory is unchanged, right? But if I do, do this uh, git diff, it tells me that there was a particular soft change. So this is uh, Gis telling me that um, the difference between what was on the safe and what uh, is currently reflected in my working directory. So remember, like, okay, so this is a nifty command which is git diff. It basically just uh, gives you a summary of the differences between what's in your safe and what's in your uh, working directory, your cardboard box. So notice that previously we did a git reset soft. We sort of changed um, sort of like the state of the safe because we moved it back, right? And that change is reflected when we call the git diff. So it's saying that like, hey, now the safe is um, different from the working directory. And this is like the summary of the changes. Yep. So TLDR, when you call a git reset, the working directory doesn't really change, but the safe is changed. And to see the changes from that change, uh, you will use the git diff command. So like, uh, if the command git diff tells you the difference between the safe and the current state of your git repo. Okay, so the question is like, if you do the reset, do you do the pull? So like, uh, the problem is that when you ever, whenever you do a reset, right, it's actually quite dangerous because you're rewriting history. So if you're resetting things that have already been pushed, right, uh, you have a very fun time because now your branch is sort of out of sync with the, it's not, it's not just out of sync, it's like diverged from a remote branch. Then you have to do this like really dangerous thing called a force, uh, force push, which basically tells Git like, 
like screw the online branch, I want to push my own branch. So yeah, yeah just be really careful what's uh, sort of sync with your remote version. Yeah. But I mean, as long as you're working on your own remote branch, right, it's perfectly fine because like you're not touching master. But if you do a git reset on master, right, and then like your team is gonna hate you. Okay, so that's the soft version. And then like there is the hard version, which is like the Hail Mary. What that basically does is it just nukes all your changes. So like that's basically like when you figure out that things are wrong and it's like not worth saving. So that it basically removes all your changes and like there's absolutely no way of getting it back. So let's be careful when you run that. So like to give that to provide an example. Uh let me just do get reset hard first. Alright, cool. So let me just make a bunch of changes. Right, so I made some changes. Let me move it to my cardboard box. Oh, sorry, my wooden box. Okay, so it's saying that okay, um, there's this in my wooden box, and let's say like screw it, nuke the whole damn thing. So I did a git, I'll do a git reset, and everything is gone, and there's no way of getting it back. Sorry. Okay, so let me commit that actually. Uh, so let's say I have commit two. Okay, so I create a new commit. So this has that particular line that I want to like nuke, right? So if I did a git reset, uh, hit hit one. So this is the soft one, right? So that would actually wouldn't change this particular file. It would just change the save. But let's say I want to change the save and the file. So I'll just do this. Hard. And it's gone. Yeah, so TLDR, if you want to nuke every damn thing, just use hard. <laughs> but if you're not sure, just do soft. And then run git diff and see what changes were made. So hopefully that, that helps. All right, so the last bit is uh, making a merging PR request. So currently, we've only been like sort of like interacting with your own repo, your own version of the online repo. You can imagine like as you sort of like level up your programming skills, you want to like collaborate on projects, you want to contribute to open source projects. So that's where like the whole PR request workflow comes in. And um, with that, within GitHub land, you do what's called like a fork. So to fork means that you're using an existing online repository as your own starting point. So the main goal of that is twofold, right? So either it's like you want to sort of uh, start your project off like what other people have done, so you fork it, or like maybe you want to contribute back to the project. So you fork it, make your changes, and then push those changes up to the original repo, and then the author will then decide whether to approve your changes or not. So the general workflow is as follows. Step one, you fork the repo. Two, you clone it. That means you download it onto your own local repo. Sorry, uh, so you fork first. So fork basically sort of copy and paste the repo such that you have your own version of the uh, repo online. Then you clone that repo, meaning that you download that repo onto your local machine. So now the repo exists in sort of like three forms. So first one is the OG one, second one is the one that you forked, and then the one that's on your local machine. So your local machine is in sync with the forked one. Right? So wherever, you, wherever changes you make on your local one, and if you have to push them up, it will be reflected in your clone uh, or forked repo, not the original repo, because you didn't own that. And suppose you're happy with the changes and you are proposing that these changes be added to the OG repo, you make what is called a pull request. So let's sort of illustrate the workflow. So to start off, uh, you can start by sort of like cloning my repo. So it'll be here. Yep, so if you do go to this particular website. So if you go to here, you can click fork. And if you click fork, you would sort of uh, redirect you to a new repo. So if you do that, so I can't find my own repo, but imagine if I were to do some other. For example, let's say I'm going to fork this one. I'll just click on this. So I'll fork it. And 
Yeah, this one's a big repo, so it's gonna take a while. So once you're done, you see that like now it's under my name, right? And then like there's this particular like forked sort of uh, URL. So this is um, for GitHub to sort of track that like where the repo originally came from. And like that linking is required if you want to make a pull request on the original repo. So when you click on fork, you ideally get this um, like double links. So the first one under your name and the second one being the OG repo. Yeah, then like um, similar to Facebook, like you can always like star repos that you like. So like feel free to star mine. Yep, so once you have uh, forked the repo, the next step is to clone it on your local machine. Right, so when you go to that particular repo, so this is the one that was forked, I click download or clone, there's this particular URL. So that's the command that you need to get cloned. So like create a new folder or go to like some other folder that's uh, disjoined from your existing git repo and run the git clone command. So once you've done that, um, the folder has been downloaded. So go ahead with that. Yeah, so like caveat here, like don't, don't run this particular command. You have to fork it first and then replace this with um, whatever that was um, like present in your own forked version of the repo. So like if you copy and paste this, it'll work, but then like it's not part of the exercise. So like to demonstrate that flow, um, I already cloned it, right? So I already forked it, it's here. And then I would replace um, the second half of the git clone with whatever that's in this particular text box. Okay, we're almost there, that's like 10 more minutes to go. Wait, so like if you have troubles like forking the repo, let me know. Okay, so I already seen like four forks, so like I should be expecting more. <laughs> Can't be bummed my fork counter, guys. Okay, so like once you're done forking, right, and have uh, cloned it onto your local repo, uh, we'll just go ahead with like the usual branching workflow. So what happens there is once you have it on your local machine, create a new branch, make some any changes they want, and then um, push that branch. And yeah, like if you're stuck, let's reset and let us know. There are currently like six works, so like, is anyone like stuck? That's a crazy low number. I guess managed to fork the repo. Um, how do I actually clear that? Uh, no, so like, um, no, you have to fork someone else's repo. So like, let's go to that particular URL. So, okay. so suppose you have to collaborate with like my project. Uh, so you just go to that URL, click fork, and then you see it copy and pasted on your own uh, local repo, uh, on your own like GitHub account. <laughs> yeah, if you guys been able to, yeah, I'll get check out dash b. So like, do you guys manage to clone it? Um, so what, what I just did is just yeah, okay. use the run that one. I thought this one. Yeah. Is there anything we have to do before this? Oh, uh, um. So you hey, which page is this? Wait. So have you forked it yet? Um. Okay. So the whole purpose of this exercise is to so like pretend that you want to collaborate yeah. with 
some other project or you want to contribute to an open source project so you go to like this open source project my repo and then you click uh, fork no. Okay, so what fork does right is that it uh, sort of like makes a, co a common copy of this repository mm -hmm. under your own account because you cannot push to this repo because it's not owned by you. Okay. So you have to make a common copy first. You then clone that one onto your local machine. Oh. You make changes, you push it up, and then you make a pull request. Oh, okay. So you cannot do clone first then you fork. Because you, you can get cloned, but then like where do you push to? Oh, okay. So you fork first then you fork. It's like you, you could like do it out of order. You get clone first, you you fork it online, and then you set the remote to this, but it's an extra step. Uh. Oh, okay. It's like, like a bit confusing for like a beginner's course. Uh, okay. okay, so now it's forked, uh, then I can, I can close it now. Uh. Yeah. You guys managed to fork the repo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, but are you familiar with like uh, branching? Do you know the branch? Branch. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm branching. Uh, on the merge config. Oh, the merge config. Okay, so um, maybe you can open up that. Do you have the PowerPoint slides? Yes, I have the PowerPoint slides. Uh, keep going down, all the way down. Uh, a bit more, this, uh, a bit more, all the way down, a bit more. Yeah, so this is the config free version, this is the merge one. So basically, you just need to create uh, another branch, and on the master branch, you change line three, and on the your test branch, you also change line three. Okay. Then you try to merge this test branch into master, and then you get a conflict because both change the same file, and the git doesn't know how to like. Merge the two. So what should I do? I mean, okay, let's say I'm in the master. I have this file here. Yeah. And then I change a line. Then I add and then I commit. Okay, then I change change to the branch. I change <coughs> the file. I add and okay, then I so commit. the problem is that if you branch off here, yeah. uh, it should also can, uh, but when you branch off here, right, the file would look like this instead of this. Oh, okay, so, so the flow is just like, uh, I'll check out A first. Yeah. I'll make some change. Yeah. And then I'll check out master. Make yep. the change yep. and then merge it in. Okay. Is this one all will be stored in the same file, is it? As in, like, it's all stored in a hidden folder. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then the one on my main file, this is actually. It's part of the master or it's part of the. It's uh, where your head is pointing at. So this reflects the current state of the project. So this is the master. Uh, depends. Like, depends on where you are. La. So if, so currently, I'm, my guess is you're a master. So this is like master branch, if you will. So but if you checked out, like, say, branch A, branch B, then this will be like branch A or branch B's version of the wall. Oh, this will be the branch of that version. Yeah. Oh, this will be the file of that version. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so like suppose that you have successfully forked the project and then you have uh, cloned it onto your local machine and you have uh, made a new branch and pushed it up. So once you've done that, right, uh, if you go back to your forked repository, you'll see this particular like uh, sort of like dialog which basically says uh, create, uh, sorry, compare and create a pull request. So on that bit, um, you can <coughs> so it's better to demonstrate, but like when you click on this particular green button, it'll tell you whether you're going to create a pull request against your local repository or against the one that you forked. So if you press on the fork repository and you um, press like sort of like submit pull request or whatnot, the owner of the repository will get a notification saying that hey, this guy wants to like merge changes into my own uh, into his repository, and um, that's when like the whole peer review process. The author says make some changes. Then what you now do is you go back to your branch, make those changes, push it back up, and uh, ping the the person again. 
And suppose once the author is happy and he approves the changes, it will be merged into his own repository. So that's what, like, the whole like Git workflow. Hopefully that makes sense. So like TLDR, like once you have like cloned the repository or whatnot, like and you push a new branch, you should ideally reach this particular state where you have that compare and pull request button. Actually, let me just demonstrate this workflow for one. Wait, uh, can I just grab your repo? Can I have your, your uh, like My repo, okay, good. Yeah. Can I have a reboot? Yeah. Oof, okay, now it's okay. Uh, can, I, did you, can I just, just grab your repo? Uh, okay, let me just... Next. Hey, sorry, did I get the URL? Yeah, okay. Okay, let me just like uh, demonstrate the whole workflow. So let's say I go to my friend's repository. So like suppose this is like the, sorry? Oh, God damn it. Okay, so suppose this is the repository I want to contribute to, right? So what I do is that I'll click the uh, fork button. So I'll fork under this account. So what this does is it creates a common copy of that particular repo, but under my name, right? Because I cannot push changes to that particular repo because it's not owned by me. So what I first do is I copy and paste it into my own ownership. So now I have the exact same repo, and it says that, okay, it, this was the OG source. And then now I'll just clone this. So what I do is that I grab the URL. Okay, then I, oh boy. Okay, okay. let me just go out. Okay, so now I do git clone. Okay, so that's, uh, it's probably a good idea to not like git clone within the current project because like now you're just like adding a new uh, project within a project, which is not what you want. So I move out, uh, then I do a git clone. So this is the link that copy pasted just now. Cool. So now I already cloned that repo. Let me go into it. Cool. So now it's master. So following the usual branch workflow, let me just do a new branch. All right. So let me just maybe modify this file. Okay, so I made some changes. Let me just commit that. All right, so I made the changes. Let me push that in. So um, in this case, I get this like weird error because like it doesn't um, sort of know its corresponding uh, online version, right? Because this is uh, the test branch. The online version does have a test branch, so I get this weird error. So in this case, I just copy and pasta this code in. So this basically tells uh, Git that, hey, the online version of test is like so. And with that done, I can push. So let me refresh that. And you see that I now get this uh, sort of yellow dialog. Let me just click compare and, pre uh, compare and pull request. So in this case, uh, the base repository is the one that I originally forked from. So that will be like, um, like the OG repository that I want to contribute back to. And where the changes are coming from, they're coming from my own repository, which is the hit repository. So in this case, it is uh, my name, the repository name, and then the branch. So in this case, I want the branch to be test. So suppose uh, I change it to master, like nothing really happens, right? Because I didn't make any changes on master. The changes will be on test. Yep, so this my commit. And then let's see, merge this in. 
So I didn't create the pull request. So in this case, you'll say that, okay, there are no conflicts. I can go ahead with the request. Then it's now up to the owner of the repository to approve this uh, PR request. So maybe the person can approve it for me. Okay, so maybe just add some comments, like have some random stuff. Yeah, then comment, and then click merge pull request. Yeah, confirm merge. Cool, thanks. Okay, so suppose the owner is happy with my changes. Oops. So in this case, it has been merged. So if I go back to his OG repo, uh, So this was the original repo that I forked. And if I look at this file, notice that my changes are now in. So this is all like the workflow when it comes to like working on like GitHub projects. Yep. So that's like the whole PR uh, workflow. So any questions on this one? Yeah, this is kind of hard to demo on one computer because like it's, uh, it involves multiple accounts. All right. Right. Oops. Yeah, so like if you made it this far, like you more or less have like the basic uh, sort of like skills to interact with Git and GitHub, and like with that, like congrats. Um, so like if you sort of like made it through this far, you can pretty much work professionally on any like GitHub project and with friends. And like for those doing 2103, like congrats, this is like pretty much like good enough. Um, so there's that. Yep. So uh, in the interest of time, like there's certain more like advanced Git topics that I didn't really cover. So like once you have like a pretty good like uh, grounding on like whatever we covered today, certain topics that you might not look into would be uh, Git rebase. So previously I mentioned that like whatever that happens in the safe should stay in the safe, and like messing with that is a bad idea. But um, Git lets you do that if you want to, uh, if you really want to, and it's called like a rebase. So like rebasing just allows you to really like, muck around with like what whatever's in the safe, and like there are some useful uses to it. But um, do check it out. The next one is like Git hooks. So it's like sometimes when you do Git commits or Git pushes, um, you might want to run certain checks. Like for example, maybe you don't want your like for example you could have like certain like tests or sanity checks that should pass before you make any push. Uh, hooks allows you to sort of add that functionality in. Next bit is like stashing, right? So uh, notice that whenever you want to save any change, it's called commits, right? But commits rewrites history or like it pushes things into the safe. So suppose I want to save certain things that I don't want to be in the iron safe. I can do it in a different box, which is called a stash. And lastly, it's like git revert, which is a commit that allows me to undo a commit. Uh, it's a mouthful. And last bit is like cherry picking, like how you win arguments online. You just uh, cherry pick things that you want. Yep, so next bit is like quality of life hacks. So like maybe after this whole exercise, you're like, oh, the terminal line is horrible to use. I have no idea what's going on. Um, 
there are certain tools that sort of like maybe alleviates the process, makes the learning curve a bit more straightforward, and like might provide a better user experience. Um, so two very common uh, softwares that are available are Source Tree and Git Kraken. Source Tree is available on Mac OS and Windows. It just basically provides sort of like a GUI interface to Git, so like you don't really have to type another line of code, uh, another line of command if you really want that. And it also comes with like all sorts of like fancy features, like it shows the changes between different commits, uh, changes between branches, things that can be done through Git, but requires like way more keystrokes. So, like if you just want to use Git, like this is probably one part you want to consider. Um, and uh, there are also like sort of Git tools that can use within your text editors. If you're using VS Code like me, certain plugins you might want to consider are Git Lens. Git Lens sort of like adds certain functionalities, like it tells you which line of code was last touched by who and which commit. Um, there's Git History Diff, which uh, provides a uh, useful shortcuts to allow you to compare between branches, between past commits, pretty useful. And like if you like a Emacs, if you use Emacs, you can consider things like Magit. And if you use uh, Terminal, you can consider this uh, tool called Tick, which is Git in reverse, like really fancy stuff. So with that, like I've reached the end of the whole Git workshop. Uh, really appreciate feedback, and with that, uh, thanks for coming. And I'll be around if you have any more questions. Hey, thanks. Actually, there's not much value add in recording sessions, right? <laughs> uh, I think there are some people that say they want to watch the recording. Fair, fair. It'll be damn weird, right? Halfway will be me speaking, then halfway.